Okay, so similar to how the last unit started, we got to start off with the basic unit of biology. The basic unit of biology is the cell, in the same way that the basic unit of chemistry is the atom. All right, and arguably it's also the basic unit of physics, but um, can't we everyone, everyone knows that chemistry is just applied physics anyway. Okay, um, so what we're looking at here is essentially the development of the idea of cells, discovery of cells, same as how we started the last unit. We got to talk a little bit about the history of, of uh, this particular science. All right, um, so. For today, we want to look at the points of the cell theory, just like there were the atomic theory, there's the cell theory, okay, and know who contributed to the development of the cell theory. The good news is it's a lot less people, okay, uh, and recognize the implication of the similarities between plant and animal cells in terms of their evolutionary relationships, okay. Um, if you look at a plant and an animal cell side by side, they have a lot in common, okay, and that's not by accident, right, there's just no chance that those things could have all appeared completely separately, okay? It's because they came from a common ancestor at some point in the distant past that shared all of those same structures that still work and still do their job and that natural selection has said is still good, okay? Uh, natural selection is very much of an if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of a mentality, okay? Now, you are going to hear me use the terms natural selection and evolution a lot in the biology unit because that is the mechanism through which organisms can change and develop. All right. Very recently, Pope Francis actually came out and said that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the idea of natural selection and evolution because it fits very well with the order in which the Bible says everything happened, which is another lesson that we're going to go through later in the unit. But, okay, just so you know, I'm not teaching you different than what you're going to learn in religion class. Okay, so just so you're all aware of that one. All right. Um, so, Cell theory. The first point of the cell theory is just like the first point of the atomic theory. All living things are made up of cells. Okay? They have to be. Okay, so let's think about this. What are some other things that all living things need to be able to do? Pardon me? Okay, exchange gases in some way, we'll say, because not everything breathes per se, but they all exchange gases. Take in nutrients, reproduce, produce wastes, okay? So all of those things, okay, are kind of the basic metabolic functions of any living organism, all right? If those were the only things necessary to be considered a living thing, then fire would be a living thing. Because fire exchanges gases, fire consumes fuel, nutrition, it produces waste products, and it can reproduce. It may not seem like it, but a spark from one fire can start another. I know that's a bit of a stretch, okay? But technically, then fire meets the criteria of a living thing except for this point. Fire is not made up of cells, it's a chemical reaction. Okay, everyone follow me on that one? Okay, so that's kind of the quintessential point here. Now, that does, however, leave some things up for debate. Okay, some things that pe some people say are alive, some people say aren't alive, okay, because they don't have cells. Anyone know what I'm thinking of? Oh, no, fetus, have, they have cells. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I mean, right from the moment of conception, that's, okay, right there at the zygote, sperm meets egg, the zygote, that's a cell, okay? So they, right, right from that moment, the genetic material necessary for you is present, okay? But that's why, of course, the Catholic Church feels the way they do about abortion, right? Um, okay, so what else? Okay, what, what, other, or, what organisms maybe? They're not really organisms, but we might consider them alive, but some people don't. No, plants have cells too. Plants are made up of cells. They make you sick. Uh, bacteria are cells, but viruses are not. Okay? Viruses are just like a shell of protein with genetic material inside. They have no cellular structures. Okay? In fact, yeah. all right, so viruses, they can't, they can't do anything on their own. 
Okay, they can't do, in fact, any of those things that we listed even fire can do. Okay, they can't consume energy. They can't produce waste products. They have no ability to, um, you know, carry out any kind of metabolism or cellular reactions. They can reproduce, but they can't do it on their own. All right, we're going to talk about viruses as part of the AP curriculum here, but um, viruses can only reproduce by using your cells machinery to produce copies of themselves. They cannot copy themselves on their own. Okay, so they actually hijack your cell and make your cell produce viruses. All right, so they can't even reproduce on their own, which has led a lot of people to argue that viruses are little more than an infectious particle. Okay, they have because they can't live on their own, they can't be considered a true organism. Okay, um, so there's argument: are they alive or not? Okay, are they a true organism? Probably not. Okay, but uh, there is sort of that argument. They certainly don't fit with a lot of the things here. Okay, they don't have cells, so they don't fit that criteria. All right, um, so what we're looking at here is a couple of different examples. We've got uh, these um, uh, actinopods, which are a marine uh, single-celled organism. Okay, um, this one's kind of like an amoeba, but it has a shell. Same with this one, you know what I mean by an amoeba? They're kind of a purpley little blob. We're going to look at them under the microscopes on Friday. Um, but these ones, they secrete a shell made of silica, glass, essentially. Okay? And it's got little holes in it, and they can stick little protrusions, pseudopods, out the holes, and that's how they feed. The food sticks to that, and then they just go, ooh, yummy, okay, and bring it in. All right? um, plants, multicellular organism, obviously made up of cells. They carry out photosynthesis. Okay? And this little guy here is a paramecium. Okay? They live in like scummy pond water and, and things like that. Okay? All right, second and third points of the cell theory. The cells carry out the basic functions of the organism. All right, that's that whole cellular metabolism thing. The basic functions of an organism, okay, have to do with being able to burn sugar for energy, okay, um, acquire or break down nutrients or create the nutrients through photosynthesis, um, get rid of their own waste products, um, have the potential for reproduction, all that kind of stuff. Danielle, question. Yes, the, yeah, these are the three points of the cell theory. Okay, and the last point is that cells are not created. They come from the division of existing cells. There's no factory in your body that's pumping out replacement cells for cells that get damaged or destroyed. Okay, the cells that are around that area divide, reproduce, and replace. Okay, the ones that were there. Stem cells are exactly that. They are cells which divide and produce more cells. Yeah, so they're not pumping out. I mean, I guess in that way they are kind of pumping out cells, but those cells are coming from the division of the stem cells themselves. Okay, now that's, I mean, there's different kinds of stem cells. The stem cells you have in your body right now are what we call pluripotent stem cells, which are, what's that? Yeah, yeah, unassigned, unspecialized, and they're mostly in your bone marrow and things like that. Okay. Um, the other kind of stem cells are embryonic stem cells, uh, and those come from, uh, well, they come from an embryo. So you fertilize an egg, you let it develop to a certain point, and then you take cells from it. Okay, um, Those cells are, for the purpose of stem cell therapies and things like that, the best there are, but there's obviously a cost to that. If you take the cells from an embryo that were going to be its liver, the embryo is going to die. Okay, so it's, uh, you know, at least the Catholic Church's view is that's one life for another life. That's, and that's not, that's, we don't believe that to be right. Okay, um, everyone has their own opinion on that, but that's the Catholic Church's view on that one. Okay, um, so they all come from the division of existing cells, and that includes us. Okay, we just talked about it a minute ago that when sperm met egg, okay, for you guys, you know, 16, 17 years ago, okay, there was a single cell formed from that called a zygote. Every cell in your body, of the billions and billions of cells that are in your body came from that single cell. Okay, it just divided over and over and over again. Very early on, okay, you would have been a ball of little cells, okay, and all those little cells would have been the same, okay, but also very early on, those cells start to specialize. 
okay? And the shape of the ball begins to change, begins to fold in on itself and creates the tube that will become your brain and spinal cord, okay? Some of the cells specialize to become your bones and muscles. Other cells specialize to become your digestive tract and internal organs, circulatory system, etc. Okay, and that does happen. That specialization begins very early, okay? We are talking like within the first couple of weeks, okay? That specialization begins. I've never heard of that. Sounds cool, though. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's essentially what we need to remember about the cell theory. This is this one here is probably the most important one. It, we come back to it all the time, especially in a bunch of our labs where we're looking at the structure of cells, okay, and things like that, and we're doing our cell anatomy lab, okay, and we're looking at what do all cells have in common. Well, cells have certain structures in common because they carry out these basic functions. I mean, you've got to have a nucleus in a cell, okay? Otherwise, you don't have the genetic material that tells you how to do things, right? Uh, you've got to have uh, a mitochondria because that's essential for burning sugars, and you need sugars for fuel, right? Things like that. So there are organelles, that's what they're called, the little structures within the cell, okay? That carry out or help carry out the basic functions of the organism. So basically, we're saying, if I could put a cell in a nutrient medium, you know, where it had everything it needed to survive, it could survive on its own. Okay, because it could carry out the basic functions. All right, development of the cell theory started in 1665 with a guy named Hook, not the captain, okay, who had the alligator with the clock in its belly, okay, we're talking about the physicist Hook, okay, um, and that, that's actually what he was. I, I'm sure that it, he turns in his grave every time he's remembered for being, discovering cells, but he was actually a physicist. Uh, and his main area of study at that time, anyway, was lenses. Okay, that's why he built the microscope. Right, his discovery of cells was purely accidental as a result of trying to make a series of lenses that could magnify things. Okay, um, and that's obviously he was successful. Okay, he managed to get uh, lenses set up in a line uh, such that they could uh, bend the rays of light uh, so that an image appeared larger. Now, what he put underneath the microscope was a piece of cork, okay? Not the synthetic cork that's used in bottles now, okay? But real cork that comes from a tree. Now, the cork that's original, like natural cork that's used in wine bottles sometimes is a dead part of the tree. So when he looked at it under the microscope, this is what he saw. What are all these? They're all cells. These are the cell walls that are left over, okay? When a tree dies, the cell walls remain behind even if the material inside the cell has died, all right? The cell walls are made of a different material that, that's wood, essentially, okay? Wood can last for a long time after a tree is dead, all right? And thank goodness, because most of our houses are built out of it, all right? So um, that's essentially what he was looking at was the cell walls left behind after the, that part of the cork tree had died, okay? Now, he called them cells because it looked like... Um, like the rooms in a monastery or the rooms in a prison, okay? The little cells, okay? That's, that's where the name comes from. It looks like little, you know, rooms, little tiny rooms, okay? That's where the name came from. And they were even square. Most plant cells do have a very rectangular or square kind of shape to them, right? So that's where the name came from, right? Now, of course, because he was looking at dead cells, he thought they were empty rooms, that, that which, of course, led to his naming of it. Had he seen living cells and seen how much was going on in there, I don't know what he would have called them. Right? Probably not cells, right? because he would have seen that they were certainly not empty. All right, after Hook came a guy named Leeuwenhoek, around the time when wigs were cool. Okay, you know, those big wool ones, all right? Um, anyway, he designed a different type of microscope that could magnify a lot more. Okay? It had much greater ability to magnify than did, uh, than did hooks, but the design didn't catch on because it was difficult to use. Okay? That's his microscope, that thing, this weird thing here. Okay? It doesn't look at all like a microscope. What he would do is um, he had the lens okay, right here in this area, and then he had this um, weird structure here that kind of comes to a point, and it had a 
kind of a depression on the top, and he would put fluid in there, okay, that contained his sample, whatever it was he was looking at, and then he could put a light source behind it, and the light source um, would go through the sample, and then through the lens and expand the image onto a screen, okay? Or if he was far enough, his arm was long enough, he might be able to see it on his eye and see it greatly enlarged, kind of like you could you do with a magnifying glass with a single lens. The farther away you put the screen, the bigger the image is going to be. It's difficult to use, though. It's hard to focus. you got to hold it still. you got to find the right distances so it didn't really catch on, okay? But he was able to magnify things a great deal larger. And most importantly, he looked at stuff that was alive. So cells were no longer empty little rooms. Cells were very busy places. Right? And he looked at various things. He looked at the stuff that's in pond water, amoebas and paramecia and water fleas and things like that. Okay? Um, he also looked at blood cells. So he can prick his finger and look at the blood cells under the microscope. Sperm cells uh, from cattle. I, I don't know how he got those. It's obviously very brave, okay? Because you don't get them from cows. You get sperm from bulls. They have big horns and they're kind of aggressive. I don't know. Obviously a brave guy, okay? Um, so he looked at those things under the microscope, okay, and was able to see that cells were living things and there was lots of, lots of processes that were going on inside. Okay, after him came the two important guys. Two Swedish scientists named... Theodor Schwann and Matthias Schleiden. Schleiden and Schwann is all you need to remember. You don't need to know their first names. Okay. Um, their hypothesis that they were running on was that if cells are the basic unit of life and lots of, or basically in animals or in plants from various living groups, okay, are examined under the microscope, then cells will be found in all of them, okay? That was kind of the hypothesis that they were running on. Notice it had an if and an and and a then part, okay? Um, so they were running on that hypothesis, and over many, many years, they found it to be true. They looked at basically every branch of the tree of life. They looked at animals. They looked at bacteria. They looked at fungus, plants, all of it, and they found unequivocally that everything was made up of cells. Of course, at this time, they didn't have, they didn't have microscopes good enough to see viruses. People didn't really understand about viruses yet, okay? Um, so they didn't see those. That might have affected their research at that time, but luckily, they didn't. Okay, so they're the ones who came up with the original cell theory. Questions there? Okay. Now, as our technologies improved, our understanding of cells has also improved because we've been better able to see what goes on inside, how they work, okay, how they reproduce, um, and things like that. All right, so if we're looking at, um, let's say, cells from a person, cells from a dog, cells from a chicken, cells from an alligator, okay, are they going to look pretty much the same? Like let's say I take a, like a skin cell or a mus let's say a muscle cell from all of them. Okay, they're all going to look pretty much the same. Yeah, because all vertebrates essentially have the same type of mus muscular tissue. Okay, I mean, I mean, I suppose they have to be a little bit different, otherwise everything would taste the same. Okay, but um, obviously they're a little bit different. But for the most part, muscles work the same in all vertebrates. So we would see pretty much similar structures within the cells. Right. Um, if I look at things that are quite different. If I look at, let's say, the cells from a mushroom and the cells of a person side by side, there's going to be more differences than there were between the animals, but there's still going to be a large number of similarities. There's still going to be a nucleus. There's still going to be a cell membrane. There's still going to be, uh, you know, mitochondria because they both got to burn sugar. There's going to be lysosomes because they both got to consume organic material for food. Okay, they they've still have the same basic requirements, and as a result, they still have the same basic structure. If I look at uh, an animal cell and a plant cell side by side, it's the same idea. There's still going to be more in common than there is different. Obviously, the difference between an animal and a plant has to do with how they get their energy. Okay? A plant's got to have all the mechanisms present for photosynthesis. That's going to, there's going to be some differences there. Cell wall versus not having a cell wall. Chloroplasts, not having chloroplasts. A giant water vacuole, 
versus not having one. Okay, because plant or plants they need to have rigid cells because they got to support themselves. They can't move around. Okay, whereas animals they need their cells to be flexible. They need to be able to bend and stretch and twist because they move. Right. So yes, there's some differences, but again, still there's a lot of the same basic structures. Okay, uh, let's skip that one there. So here's animal and plant cell side by side. Okay, so let's just make little tick marks for things they have in common and things that are different. Okay, so we'll say same and different. All right, so big purple thing. Same? Okay. They both have a little purple thing inside the big purple thing. Same? Okay. So we got all the stuff to do with the purple thing. The nucleus, by the way, is this real name. I'm just calling it the purple thing today. Okay. Um, what about this blue stuff here? Do they both have that? Okay. Rough. That's a rough endoplasmic reticulum. They both have that. Okay. And then they, there's this other blue stuff that looks a little bit different here. Okay. They both have that. All right. Um, these orange kind of sausage shape looking things. They both have those. Those are mitochondria. Okay. Um, this thing here looks like they both have one of those. That's a Golgi apparatus. That's six things in common. Okay. Um, they're kind of the same color inside, which imply they're both filled with fluid, right? Like they're not filled with air. If your cells were filled with air, that would be bad as you heat up and, and cool down. Your cells would expand and contract, okay? which would not be good. Okay? Um, so they're both filled with that fluid. Okay? They both have a clear membrane on the outside. Okay? So there is, there is one on both of those. So that's seven things in common. Um, oh, yeah, we got the bean-shaped thing already. The mitochondria got those already. Oh, was there something else that I'm missing? Okay, well, let's say that we'll, we'll stop there at eight for now. Okay, things that are different. Well, plant cells got a cell wall. Animal cell doesn't, so that's one thing that's different. Okay, plant cells have these green things, and I don't see any green things in the animal cell. Agreed? Okay, so two things that are different. Um, big water vacuole versus not having it. Anything else that looks different, Max? Oh, yeah, the flagellum. That's mobility versus not being mobile. I suppose we could say that as a difference. Okay. So you got eight things in common, four things that are different. And that doesn't even start, that's just structure. Okay. We didn't even look at processes. Okay. The little chemical reactions and, and things that go on inside. If we started looking at those, this would just go. Okay, it would just, it would be, it would skyrocket. The stuff they have in common is so much greater than the stuff that's different, all right? Now, what that means for us is that most likely, very early on in Earth's history, okay, there was basically one kind of living organism, all right? Where would it have probably lived? Where? In the water, yeah. Okay. Would it, most most people agree that life started in the oceans on Earth. Okay, and it probably would have been very simple, right? And it, you know, it would have probably had to use photosynthesis most likely okay, as a source of energy. Okay, um, and then as you know, the diversity of life increased, then we would have had the branches of different life, but they still would have shared the same basic cellular structure. Uh, seaweed um, has a type of wall. It's not the same as a terrestrial plant, uh, but you're, yeah, they wave quite a bit differently. Uh, aquatic plants um, are more like true algae than terrestrial plants. There's a lot of structural differences to do with water conservation and support. Right? You live in a supportive medium like water. You don't have to have a thick trunk like you do when you have a non-supportive medium like air. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so what's happening now is there's a whole new branch of science called micropaleontology that looks at microscopic fossils and tries to trace that kind of evolutionary path that life followed on Earth. Okay, we don't just do that science on Earth. Okay, we've got spacecraft on other planets that are capable of doing the same thing. Okay, the little Curiosity rover and the Spirit and Opportunity, but well, one of them is dead now, but... One of them's still going. Opportunity's still going, and Curiosity are still going. Um, but they actually have like 
x-ray x-ray like microscopes and things like that on board those rovers that scan the rocks at a microscopic level looking for fossil evidence okay as well as minerals and chemical evidence of life okay so it's a it's a big branch of science that allows us to look at things that we would have overlooked even 20 years ago all right microscopy we're going to be looking at this quite a bit more tomorrow okay i'll bring in a microscope and show you all the parts and we'll get started on the pre-lab for the lab on friday okay carrying a microscope is important carrying it properly is even more important because they're expensive okay the ones we left behind for you guys at john paul ii they were you know, pretty much junk when we left them okay they're probably even more junk now all right um the ones that we have here are, are better, they're newer, uh, but they're delicate, and they're about 700 bucks a piece to replace, okay? So they're not cheap. Um, so we have to carry them carefully. We have to be mindful of where the power cord is. We have to be carrying them with two hands always, one on the arm and one on the base, okay? Um, we always want to make sure we start with the, the smallest lens, the scanning power lens, so that we don't drive it through the slide and break the slide and crack and scratch the lens and do all kinds of things that'll make Coderre fly into a murderous rage. Okay, um, so we want to avoid those kinds of things. Okay, um, other things have to do with like cleaning. This this is one that I see. This is probably the source of most of our damage to our microscopes. Okay, is people oh there's a smudge on my microscope. Okay, and they lick their thumb and they smear it all over the lens, which makes it way worse than it was before. Okay, but the problem with that is that you can have m grit on your fingers that you wouldn't even notice, but will scratch the lens. And when you look through something that magnifies things, if there's a scratch on it, what does it do to the scratch? It magnifies and it makes it look like there's this big, long, sneaky looking thing across the lens. So we got to, I'll show you the care of the microscope tomorrow.